Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Reynes, and I'm the uh, Deputy Director General of the Investment and Development Agency of Latvia. And it is my great privilege to welcome you all here either this morning, this afternoon, or this evening uh, for this discussion on uh, COVID and government aftershock. Uh, we are uh, hosting this event uh, proudly in cooperation with the OECD. And the main aim for today is to actually understand uh, how has the world been impacted and what are the lessons learned for the governments and how should we uh, move on and proceed. Um, historically, uh, LIA, as the Investment and Development Agency of Latvia, uh, is, uh, has been very proud in the fact that uh, we are hosting discussions and opinion exchanges. So. At this storm of times, we believe that it is more important than ever to do so. But uh, before we move on to the discussion, which is the second part, and I must say the most, uh, I suppose, exciting part of today, uh, let me introduce uh, my boss and uh, I suppose uh, one of the most uh, futuristic, futuristic uh, public servants uh, in uh, Latvia. Uh, the uh, general director of the agency, uh, Kaspar Sroškans, with a keynote. Uh, Kaspar, the floor is yours. Thank you, Rainis. Uh, first of all, I really hope this is going to be recorded and uh, our IT guys will not cut the <laughs> before the 3, 2, 1 part, because that was probably the best. Uh, uh, today, uh, the keynote, 15 minutes. Uh, well, we're, we're behind schedule, so I'll try to be may maybe a little bit shorter, but to deliver the most important message uh, across. And obviously this, uh, from Pirat, we heard that Australia is winning and, and this is something that we must change next year. So that is the most important message. But uh, if uh, joking aside, uh, uh, when we think uh, the government of the shock, what, uh, what will change? And uh, to start with, uh, to discuss on, on what will change, we have to go through what happened. And uh, during the March, and uh, we we went into the lockdown, and uh, we stayed away. To two people, two meters, etc. Everybody went uh, suddenly online. Education uh, previously was not operational online, and then it just happened in in like one week. Um, we all uh, went online and started to shop online like crazy. Uh, first of all, we uh, we we were not able to to buy clothes online, but then you figure out, wow, there's 14 uh, days uh, like uh, return policy, and and you can buy, and if it doesn't fit, you just uh, turn back. Uh, we we watch the patterns, what changes in um, in households. For example, the uh, home baked bread, uh, the devices to make home baked bread went up for 600 percent in sales. This is uh, this is something that that you can uh, see that the dumbbells, uh, so uh, the physical activities uh, moved from the gyms to home, and so the sales of dumbbells uh, went up 300 percent. And this is uh, this is uh, all good from uh, from from how, how we were able to manage to jump on on this online thing. But in the government, what happened in the government, uh, we figured out that uh, these old restrictions to stop uh, our exports, uh, stopped uh, most of the businesses, and uh, we had to develop the strategy, uh, how to get out of it. And uh, more or less, we, we, we based the strategy on, on three steps. It is uh, stabilize, uh, restructure, and grow. And uh, later on, when, when uh, I talked to the business Finland, uh, when I uh, talked to the uh, Norwegian Innovation Norway, we all uh, made up similar strategies, uh, three or maybe four steps uh, with similar paths, uh, similar approaches to, to use this uh, time of crisis to, to grow, to grow bigger, to grow uh, better, to grow more efficient. Etc. So that is actually is not unique what happened in Latvia. But what was unique, what, what actually happened in, during this uh, time of crisis, we also worked on a, on a side event, let's say, we defined the core values of, uh, of Latvian nation uh, unified brand. This is something that we are trying to do for the past 30 years and it never uh, ever went into something good. 
And this time, well, we tried again. And, uh, and this time we used different approach. We used five working groups with uh, more than 100 experts in, in each of them. And uh, the main task through the design thinking was to, to define three core values or, or four core or values or five, whatever happens, happens. And then uh, during, during this period, uh, we figured out that actually the values for exporters are very similar to the values uh, for culture people. The values for uh, for uh, um, foreign affairs uh, and uh, let's say safety are, are very similar to values of uh, investors. Then we were able to, to narrow it down through this design thinking process to the three core values. The, the number one, the Latvia is uh, very good at connecting people. Um, and it's not Nokia, it's Latvia. And uh, it means that uh, we are able to connect through uh, languages because we speak three languages. We are able to connect through culture because uh, for the last 800 years we were under someone, either Germans or uh, or Russians or, or Swedes, etc. So we have great cultural experience. Um, we are able to connect uh, through distance. Uh, through, let's say, uh, we were able to to live in uh, our current current city and and, and uh, work in um, capital, and we have a lot of uh, hundreds of examples how we connect. To, at the end of the day, we connect to each other by by two fist, fist bumps. Currently, the number two value uh, is uh, the challenges. So we need a great challenge to raise up to it and to, to show the world that we can manage uh, everything very good. And again, we, we come back to this, to the COVID-19. During the pandemic, during the March, April, we, uh, May, and, and during the summer, uh, we were uh, doing the best in, in numbers with, with COVID-19 because it was a huge challenge. Nobody understood what was happening. And, and then we were able to go into this mission-oriented innovation through this process, everybody came together. We talked to each other and we figured out what is the best, the best solution, what is the best approach, how to uh, deal with that. And then the the third, uh, the third value on uh, is on uh, this the powerhouse of uh, creativity, of thinking outside the box. Uh, when um, Latvians, uh, let let's say. Uh, think outside the box, uh, it's, it's our normal mindset because uh, from the Soviet times when we didn't have any tools or resources, we had to think outside the box every day. So it is in our genes currently to think outside the box. So it means that we, we do not, uh, we do not uh, try to beat uh, the Germans in a uh, soccer match because that's probably impossible. We just invent a skeleton and, uh, and win everybody in the world. And we see that uh, this also ha happened with, with the basketball in the first uh, uh, European uh, championship in, in basketball. We were uh, playing the finals. And uh, again, that never happened, uh, happened later on. We were in the process of inventing that. We were thinking outside the box. And uh, what does it all uh, relies back on, uh, on government aftershock? Actually, what, uh, when we talked about uh, the, this uh, OECD panel and how we would sh should approach the problematic, we figured it out that actually if we want to position ourselves as a, a country of creativity or, or powerhouse of innovation or, or something that combines these values, then also the government needs to change. And uh, then we took the, one of the best COVID-19 examples uh, of uh, how uh, the application stop the COVID-19 was created. When we had the mission, we had to stop the COVID-19. Government, uh, the multinationals, uh, the, the local champions, they all came together to solve this issue and we were able to, to get from the idea to the work, workable uh, application on, uh, on the phone during the one month or one month and a half. And when then we saw the, the other countries who tried the classical approach, tried to, to tender this uh, application, tried to write the technical specification, so we were able to, to buy it on, uh, on tender rules. And they are still trying to buy it. And, uh, and this, is, uh, this is something uh, that, uh, that shows us the path. 
how to, how to go with that. So during uh, for this uh, OECD uh, panel, we also created uh, the design thinking uh, working group to define what will never ever be the same again. That came out from some kind of song. Sorry for that. But uh, we went through the process and, uh, and and we went through the process what we will miss from the COVID-19 times when when that ends, if it ends. And uh, and uh, and each uh, defined something that say something good. What is happening now is uh, that that you can uh, manage more time at home. Something good is happening now. You you do not need to iron your shirts that much. And uh, there are a lot of good stuff uh, apparently that is that is happening uh, now. But then uh, when uh, the summer went uh, down on the numbers and uh, we had the, even like four or five days consecutive with zero and in new infections. Everybody went back to the shops. Uh, the online shopping dropped down and, and everybody went, uh, went, went back and, uh, and, and shopped uh, as, as normal. It, it went very quickly back to the normal life. We, we jumped to the normal meetings. Uh, however, we before that, we already discussed that these meetings, Zoom meetings are very productive, very efficient, very fast, but still we jumped back. Then the question uh, when we did this uh, this design thinking working group, the question is, is it because of the generation? Because we are we are the old school generation. We are used to this uh, normal process with the meetings that you have to drink coffee. You have to have the small talk. You have to have the water cooler talk, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And maybe the next generation, they will not need that. They will be able to to do everything online. And this is the question that uh, we probably don't have an answer now. But uh, then we went uh, a little bit further on, on on why do we miss the water cooler talks? Why do we miss the conferences? And uh, and what will never be uh, the same again as, uh, as as before that? Let's say we went to the business trips. We, we figured out the business trips is some part that's, that's going to change. And then we, we drill deeper in, in the business trips. OK, yes, from the company's perspective, it's very good because you don't need to send your employees to the business trips that much. They uh, they can uh, manage everything online or most of the things. Therefore, the business trips uh, would probably be something that will change. Either they will be longer, uh, uh, or or maybe the business trips will move in the way that uh, the local teams will be bigger and stronger, or maybe the business trips uh, will uh, will move to the more hybrid approach. Uh, we we explored the opportunity of VR and figured out that VR is so far to the reality, um, to the, let's say, an option. So you would 100% move onto digital and uh, and you would be able to, to join the conference 100% digitally. It's so far that it's not uh, coming in, in, in really next years. And then we went even deeper in that and, and drilled out why this is important, why we actually took this topic. And, and then we figured out that actually the problem is that we are we are missing this, uh, the flow of, uh, of thinking, uh, of free thinking and ex exchange of uh, communication between random people where a lot of ideas uh, are made. Now, we will not miss probably the, just uh, the, the trip to the big exhibition hall in somewhere in Germany, but but we will miss this in, in this exhibition hall. You meet five or ten customers that you prearrange, but you meet 50 probable customers and you exchange things uh, and, and you have new thoughts and you then come back. And from that, those new thoughts, you generate new ideas. You see the feel of the new city. You see the developments of the new city. Then you come back and, and you bring something with, with that back back home and, and generate new ideas. Therefore, we, we can say that uh, the current uh, digitalization, the level of the digitalization of wh where we are in some way are actually slowing down the process of innovation. And uh, and this is something that uh, that uh, is. New thing that that we were not able to to figure it out and, and this is something that we can take as a government institution and try to put the in the incentives to the new instruments how to support the the process of innovation how to create maybe the innovation hubs how to create the covid free zones or or whatever else there is is 
possible so we would be able to to keep the the innovation alive in the same level or even boost it bigger so the key takeaway of this we do not have all the answers uh, to the, the the big questions of uh, for the government after shock but what do we have we have very clear understanding on paths how to get those answers and this is probably the best what happened uh, from the COVID-19 that uh, currently we, we try to implement this uh, mission-oriented in innovation in, uh, in multiple processes in our agency and in the bigger picture if we will not fail if we will succeed we know that uh, somebody needs to carry the torch and others will follow. I will end. Thank you very much. And the floor is back to Rainis. Thanks, Kaspar, for that. Uh, we really appreciate your inputs. And um, <clears throat> yeah, um, as, uh, as rightfully mentioned by Kaspar, then uh, um, actually as a founding block for this uh, presentation and for this discussion and event was a uh, design thinking masterclass, if I may say so. Uh, uh, that uh, was organized by the agency uh, in order to kind of uh, outline the way forward. And uh, as we are doing it in recording, then uh, uh, I will uh, I will ask my colleagues to put on the video now in order for the viewers to uh, see how did we go. So um, actually now we are ready to move forward to the second part uh, of the event, uh, to the discussion. And uh, I must say that I am extremely proud about uh, the panel that we have of speakers. And uh, right from the get-go, I would like to say that uh, uh, as we are probably either um, alone in our offices, uh, either in bureau buildings or at home, I would like for this conversation indeed to be uh, to be free, less formal, and uh, just uh, jump the queue when uh, whenever you're ready. Uh, following on uh, what was said uh, by Kaspers and myself, then uh, actually this discussion derives from the uh, design thinking masterclass, and I'm very glad when I when I see the list of panelists that uh, we actually have half and half of participants who participated in the masterclass, and then. We have either representatives from the same institutions or we have uh, completely new uh, participants in order to uh, share some uh, new insights and shed some new light. So um, I will uh, introduce each of the panelists alphabetically. Uh, so uh, we're very glad that uh, Mr. Svals Abos, the chairman of the uh, Children Clinical University Hospital of Latvia is uh, joining us today. Hi, Valt. Uh, then uh, also uh, the representative from Riga Technical University and the deputy vice rector, uh, uh, Mr. Gatis Bajbauers. Gati, thanks for joining us today. Uh, then uh, Ms. Ines Dabuola, uh, strategic cooperation manager for the Riga International Biennale of Contemporary Arts. Hey, Ines, good to see you. Glad to have you with, here, with us today. Uh, Mr. Jakob Skrievinch, uh, member of the bo uh, board of the financial institution Altum, my counterpart from the Latvian bureaucracy. Hey, Jakobs. Then uh, Mr. Sjani Schwalschleis, the chairman of the board 
company Primex, uh, uh, also uh, part of the core team for uh, driving up uh, for drawing up the uh, COVID-19 uh, post uh, strategy for the Latvian government. Hey, Yanis, good to uh, good. To, uh, we're great uh, to. We're very grateful that uh, you join us today. And last but definitely not the least, uh, Pire Tonuris, the uh, representative of OECD from the Observatory of Public Sector Innovation and also working us, uh, with us closely on a on, on couple of other uh, projects. So, hey, Pirit, we really appreciate your time. Hey. So, uh, I, uh, I must be honest, uh, I uh, forwarded uh, some of the questions uh, uh, in order to guide us through the discussion uh, beforehand to the panelists. And uh, one of uh, one of the issues uh, that was uh, picked upon uh, picked up by by Kaspers was uh, actually uh, the change or the surprising phenomenon of COVID, because uh, throughout the masterclass, uh, what we felt was that sometimes uh, people and professionals across the globe uh, sometimes cannot differentiate exactly uh, between the truly new things that have been brought up by COVID say a change in behavioral or patterns and between actually some recent phenomenon that has always been there but maybe that because of our particular um, existence and living in particular bubble that we haven't been exposed to uh, for instance uh, video conferences or seminars uh, for for most of us i suppose uh, throughout covid it's something completely new to wake up with a seminar call or video call while actually some of the largest corporations across the globe have been living like that for the last 10 or 15 years. So um, I would like to uh, start off uh, by asking each of our panelists uh, just to uh, give us uh, one example or one uh, thing for thought about uh, which one surprising phenomenon that uh, uh, there forever, but more recently active and more recently kind of uh, brought to the board and uh, one uh, issue or phenomenon that uh, has really changed and that the panelists believe uh, that will stay here uh, for some time so um actually for this i do not have any particular order so uh, um i don't know if uh, there is uh, no hands being raised at the moment then uh, I suppose uh, we could just kind of go uh, alphabetically back. So, uh, Piret, if, uh, if you could uh, share us some, uh, some thoughts. Something that has fundamentally changed through the crisis, you said. Uh, I think uh, what has been happening with the crisis is that uh, uh, actually the adoption of technology has been speeding up, as you said, as well as so that none of these kind of technologies were born during the crisis itself. Uh, but we're actually already developed uh, kind of the video conferencing technologies and others are already dating back to the beginning of 2000, uh, 2000s with the uptake of telemedicines, for example, that we have uh, policy documents from the beginning of 2000, 2001 that advocate this, but it was never taken up. So what the, I think that the one, one of the foremost things that immediately the crisis has done is actually accelerated the adoption of technology. And this acceleration will have also fundamental effects because what we're seeing is now is that uh, businesses worldwide are also adopting robotic technologies that are already there, uh, but they also cut out kind of the vulnerable elements, which of course are humans who get sick and cannot travel and cannot uh, be part of the kind of the reliability of logistics uh, in these big industries. So there will be a huge kind of adoption of uh, kind of robotics in industry as well and the change in value chains because if you are also using robotics that you can also produce uh, your goods in more expensive areas. So there's a potential that industry will also change its location because of it and change the kind of the value chains because of it. So there's a big change in kind of the future of work uh, coming forward and kind of the first uh, impacts of this is that we only see it now at kind of teleworking, uh, but I think that the speed of change will accelerate even further. Okay, excellent. Uh, thanks, Spirit. Uh, Janis, uh, Janis Oschleis, uh, may, you, may you share some comments with us? Mm. Yes, thank you. Um, I feel that uh, the COVID crisis is a shock. Uh, which is similar maybe to other shocks that we've had uh, let's say the let's say we had a shock of world war ii 
And uh, also during that time, technologies that were known accelerated really fast and then uh, that became used because uh, the, during the crisis, the, the need for change is, is far higher. So I feel that uh, this uh, crisis is the same. So it's, uh, it's a great accelerator of technologies. And then my question is, you know, which technologies are going to uh, uh, be prevalent? What are the, uh, how the world is changing overall? And uh, where is kind of our place? And, uh, and what is our answer? And I think that that was also the, the question and the answer that was asked and, uh, during the Latvia uh, strategy, because we asked uh, essentially how the world has changed. Uh, we didn't what is going to be. We didn't know what are going to be the goals for Latvia because that was too difficult. But we certainly knew that we could ask the question how the world has changed. And then based on that, you know, how can we benefit and how can we prosper out of this? And I feel there's a lot of opportunities for uh, great prosperity. I think that every crisis is a great time to grow and great time to really quickly advance up on the technological ladder. It's not an easy time to grow. It's a difficult time to grow. It's complicated time to grow, but it's a great time to grow. So that is how I view this crisis as a great opportunity. Okay, okay. excellent. Thanks. Uh, actually, uh, we have been picking on on uh, on, on businesses, but uh, maybe Ines, uh, would you would you mind sharing uh, how how what is the change in the art world or in the art of culture, and can you draw some parallels there? Um, you have uh, muted your microphone, sorry. This wouldn't be a real uh, kind of discussion without it. Yes, yeah, sorry for that. So uh, I think that one of the things that surprises all of us is that actually this is the first time in the history, actually, as far as we can remember, when the whole world is thinking about this, the same thing at once. Yes, Johannes already mentioned World War II, but if we look at the globe, it's not that everyone in the world was like worried about this uh, uh, war state at, uh, at that time, or World War I, but especially in the beginning of the year or in the spring, when everyone was trying to isolate and to find the possibilities to work, to, to go somewhere, to communicate, this was absolutely new thing. And this is also very fascinating but because we had this possibility to experience when we know for sure what about people are thinking and worried uh, are about, in, uh, I don't know, in America, in India, in Asia, in Europe, wherever. It's the topic, even though there are, of course, skeptics, but uh, a lot. But this is the topic, like a major thing that uh, came to us on, like, um, we were not expecting it. Also, we were kind of. And we managed to find the way how to live with this and how to respond to it super quickly, super fast. And this new normality, also now you are all uh, placed on my desk at my home at, and it's it's absolutely normal that we can discuss whatever. Uh, also, we would spend a whole day, I believe, in some in the center of Riga instead. And, and this is what surprised me for sure. And speaking about what you ask about cultural sector, of course, like, um, cultural sector is one that uh, suffered significantly due to this crisis, especially all the activities that are like venue based, museums, concerts, cinemas, um, their drop of uh, uh, like money that the earnings that they got, it's huge. And for example, to give, give you one example, it's like 90% of museums worldwide were closed. It's like around 85,000 institutions. And we also have to understand that um, some of them will never reopen again. And so, yes, this state is very worrying. And of course, we are all looking for the possibilities, how to respond to it and to find the new ways like to survive as well. Mm -hmm. OK, uh, thanks. Uh, thanks, Ines, for that. Uh, uh, Valt, uh, if I if I may, I would actually like to turn to you at the moment because uh, I think what is interesting how each uh, each country uh, has responded uh, in various fields, uh, maybe to some extent differently and with uh, and with settings. But health, I suppose, is uh, quite a similar issue all across the board. So maybe you could uh, share some insight in in your introductory remarks. 
Well, thank you. I, I, I can share, um, although I wasn't part of the uh, design thinking exercise, so I will present like absolutely fresh view and uh, without knowing. Which is them. great. Okay, so uh, I uh, will reflect a little bit later on, uh, on uh, this uh, digitalization or, or telemedicine stuff, uh, but uh, responding to your first question about which phenomena what were already here and, and well known and what was new. So uh, I would start a little bit with a, like a, uh, that crisis uh, in a way was um, a revelation of uh, basically the things which uh, are, uh, are well known and pre-existing. Uh, like injustices and failures um, uh, of, of the systems. And uh, probably we were blind to these failures before, but uh, it wasn't, uh, well, basically it was impossible not to see them now. And, uh, and that's, I think, is, is more, most distressing about the crisis, uh, that not everything was absolutely new. One remarkable uh, thing is the variations in COVID infections and outcomes. And these really appear to reflect uh, existing uh, economic inequalities, but also inabilities to adopt common approach. We saw that every single country really initially turned to different scenarios. And there are many things where we can uh, come to the common agenda, but health uh, not always be, been, been one of those. Uh, other thing is remarkable mismatch between the, I would say, um, the social value of what the key workers, like for example medics, do, and the low wages they received, and uh, and um, and that follow from the uh, again from familiar failure of the market really to value adequately what really matters, and that was well known before. Now, but it came up to the surface uh, during the crisis, and there were like uh, uh, very quick uh, ways to 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 address that. The other thing which was well known is uh, really that happy if I, I can say embrace or the partnership between the disinformation and misinformation uh, about the virus. That also was expected, but, um, uh, uh, and that was expected given the rise of uh, this, uh, given the decade of the rising populism and, uh, and declining faith in experts. So, and, and we saw it very clearly during the crisis. So that was, these phenomena uh, were escalated, but uh, were uh, well known and expected. So what's new, I would say very, probably narrowly, one uh, that uh, what will change is the virus screenings will likely become part of our life. Uh, very similarly, like security measures became uh, ever present after 9-11, yeah? That's part of mm -hmm. our life now. Uh, ability to detect and early and and and, and also uh, also lock the uh, the future viral outbreaks uh, will be part of our life uh, definitely for a long time, if not forever. So I stop here. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Waltz. Uh, Gatis, uh, if I if I may, I would like to turn uh, to you at this moment because I also know that. Uh, in your academic research, you're actually also modeling uh, future. So probably uh, you can share us with uh, your thoughts on, on the change and on the phenomenon, both that has surprised you and both that you have uh, thought about uh, for some time now already. Yeah, thank you, Rainis. Um, well, uh, I would like to give one specific example changed uh, globally in the research community, and that is uh, online conferences. This is something that we actually never had at that scale, because conferences were usually the, uh, the opportunity to meet, uh, meet other researchers and to exchange ideas, and they were always uh, in the presence. But then, uh, then uh, from, the, from the spring, they, most of conferences, of course, went on online. And, um, experience with these conferences showed that actually these conferences can be quite efficient and, and quite good. Uh, uh, and there are several positive things about these conferences that should be kept. Of course, uh, one important part which cannot be done on online conferences is face-to-face -face meeting, meetings, but what what is becoming quite apparent that in future we will have kind of hybrid, most likely we will have hybrid conferences, 
with let's say one part of exchanging information and presentations online, another part maybe face-to-face -face meetings or something like that. Uh, and uh, uh, second thing is that we were in, in a technical university, for example, we were discussing digitalization for years and nothing really happened or, or at least the progress was very slow. And then suddenly everybody started to use digital tools for meetings, for, for teaching. Actually, all the teaching went online. We had massive online, open online courses before already, so it's not a new thing, but, but, uh, but, but we didn't have that scale of online teaching. Um, so I would say that uh, the interesting question is that how these hybrid forms of online and offline will be combined in the future in a very efficient way. So we will have to find the new forms of, of hybrid, let's say hybrid operation. And that, that is something very interesting. And, 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 and if you look globally, I think that, uh, uh, that researchers, uh, science as such gained popularity in society because now we see that suddenly society turns to researchers and says, well, we need we need new medicine, we need vaccine for, for the for the for the for the COVID. And research becomes very important again. Mm -hmm. So so okay. this is something good, I think, for, for yeah. researchers. Yeah, thank you. And uh Jakobs, uh, not definitely not the least, uh, maybe from Autumn's perspective or from your personal perspective. Uh, thank you. Uh, two things, I think. One, one, one thing which is uh, changing a lot and what surprises me actually, I, I think perhaps in the different industries it's different, but for me, uh, it's surprising is how this crisis is uh, uh, taking off borders between your office and your house. And, and uh, so these boundaries of your where you work and when you work, those are swept away in a very fast, surprising way. And that, I think that is change. one change which uh, could stay here, that people will, will learn to do their job differently and, and uh, provide service. That's one thing. Second thing, I think this crisis actually uh, reminded this old saying, which I don't know who said and who invented it, uh, but uh, it was like uh, saying, like, if you want a peace, get ready for war. And this mm -hmm. is once again shown that this is a really true thing. We see companies which are flourishing now, which are uh, taking uh, taking opportunities provided by this crisis and and growing and, and inventing things. Then you think why they can do it. That's because they had these capab capabilities. This, they were ready to, on one hand, to absorb crisis. They were ready financially from processes, from peoples, from, from values in companies. They had internal trust. And then when this opportunity came, they were ready to do this. So I think this is one takeaway which everyone has to, to I don't know how, somehow put on a wall or something to remind it that you have to be ready. You have to be resilient. You have to be healthy and have to be smart already before something strikes. And this is not only companies, this is also uh, from, from state and to, from state, uh, all institutions and state uh, 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 agencies and companies. I don't think uh, state would be able to roll out uh, and, uh, which were, were rolled out in few weeks by Altum, by LIA, by State Revenue Service, if there were no already those people, processes and financials, when decisions were made to roll them out. So for, for me, I think this is very strong example that uh, there is this difference between companies which are taking opportunities, gaining from this crisis and companies are losing main difference will be what is in company already before this crisis. Thank mm -hmm. Thanks. 
Um, actually, uh, I must say that uh, we will try to be agile and actually adjust the discussion because um, of, of the answers that I heard. And uh, maybe the first question that we had in mind regarding the speed of innovation, it has already been uh, partly covered. So uh, by, by what was said uh, before me, I would like to raise a question about the state involvement. And if you will allow me, I will ask uh, Waltz, uh, Janis, and Ines uh, give their insights. Because uh, something that uh, Waltz said uh, struck me because it was also one of the, uh, Waltz didn't participate in the design thinking discussion, but he picked uh, upon particular question that was raised also throughout our former discussion about the state involvement. And I think it was Ingmar's from the uh, LMT who uh, said that uh, crisis like this shows that uh, actually uh, there is potentially room for bigger state involvement, uh, not uh, only in economics, but also, say, in healthcare. And Ines was talking about uh, uh, the scale of culture and art world maybe kind of breaking down a bit or, 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 or not being available so much. So my question is the following. Uh, bigger state involvement uh, because of COVID and in the future, yes or no? Uh, Walt, uh, if if we can uh, start with you, uh, you are you you are muted. Sorry. Clearly yes, but still I would like to 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 go back a little bit because I I, I didn't had an opportunity to reflect on another thing regarding that uh, digitalization of the sector, and that's also probably uh, might be the part of involvement uh, of building the digital ecosystem. Uh, there are two sectors uh, where there has been really long talk of going digital, but very little changed. Uh, and, uh, and these are health and education. And in fact, both sectors have uh, now entered really in a, in a process of force adoption and, and also the experimentation with the technology as a result of, 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 of this crisis and lockdown. So the force adoption of new technologies in recent months means that um, in a way people have uh, been forced or compelled to use the technologies that they might never in fact uh, have used and, and and in fact this experience uh, is happening on a large scale uh, and that redefines uh, big time the status quo and and represents a real change even though you said that uh, technologies were there and, and everything was known but that 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 momentum is, is something big. Uh, why I'm saying that? So adoption results in learning, which triggers then experimentation, and ultimately it's uh, adaptation and evolution. Yeah, and 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 this process in, is really continuous and irreversible. There is rarely, rarely, uh, any going back once the status quo has shifted. So we are not. You, you said about the online shopping and and. Uh, this, well, uh, when the lockdown disappears, going back to the normal. So I think that status quo, which has shifted, will never really move back the health sector and also education sector back to, to the pre-crisis. So the status quo has shifted. And uh, yes, and, and that, that's, I think, is, is, is one important thing to mention and also to take into account when we think about the government involvement and, 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 and potentially uh, further actions. So the other thing uh, which which uh, which I think is uh, is is uh, worth to consider also from a government perspectives. Uh, well, clearly the, the the realities of crisis have triggered the reconsideration of several beliefs, uh, with a, with a possible effects on a, on, a, on long term choices for the economy and society. And and well, some of them were mentioned, and and these range from. Uh, really the attitudes about uh, densification of uh, economic activity with a living and that's general but in my field i'd like to emphasize the beliefs about the efficiency versus resilience and really the importance of strategic reserve uh, for uh, some kind of ad hoc response and expansion so for example the hospitals uh, can't operate constantly at the upper limit of efficiency which we were trying to do for the for the for the well quite significant uh, time and uh, because that will limit our ability really to respond to any crisis situation and this 
this really needs to be considered now and built into any, in, any, any, any future actions. And that regards infrastructure, human resources, also the stocks available. So we, we've been constantly like going lean, yeah? But this kind mm -hmm. of crisis uh, uh, shows that probably there is a different approach needed, specifically where there is no substitute, like children's hospital, just one hospital like that. So no substitute for that. So you need to build in some different uh, policies and approach. Mm -hmm. Thanks, uh, Yanis. <clears throat> yes, the Latvian strategy of overcoming the COVID crisis was uh, that we developed uh, between March and May. Uh, had uh, the the main kind of three action points: stabilize, reset, and try. And uh, we said that first phase needs to be stabilization because uh, the uh, uh, in a crisis like this. And I think the previous speaker, uh, Strabos, correctly pointed out that you need additional resilience and additional kind of slack uh, built into uh, any company to survive the crisis. But that slack is impossible to have, especially if you are running a high growth, uh, innovative companies, uh, because by nature they will be unbalanced. So the only actor that can really preserve uh, innovative companies and uh, that can really kind of help overall, be it Children's Hospital, many other places, is the state. So I think from that perspective, the role of the state as a stabilizer during great tumult becomes uh, far more important. The important question, uh, of course, uh, whenever you are doing, using a state is how not to support companies that were bound to fail anyway. And then that's why the, uh, the the question that was the next in, in the strategy was reset, uh, which was asking how the world has changed. So understanding how the world has changed and which technologies, which companies, subtypes, which sectors are going to thrive, it uh, becomes quite clear uh, what we should uh, prop up to grow and what we should simply kind of prop up to be a, a, like a get social peace or a, or a smooth transition. and. Uh, so I feel that uh, uh, then going through these steps and getting to the trial phase, the goal, role of the state becomes also very important because it is to provide resources, opportunities, resources in, in terms of educated people, resources in terms of healthy people, resources definitely in terms of also finances because a big crisis like this always uh, put finances, both of companies and also banks and uh, other uh, sectors in doubt. So uh, you, you don't have so much expansion capital anymore with which to use and actually gain in the opportunities that the crisis opens up. So uh, the question was, uh, what about the state involvement? I believe that the smart state involvement is critical and crucial in, a, in, a, in overcoming crisis like this. I believe that, uh, that uh, kind of Latvian strategy stabilize, reset, thrive uh, was a very good, uh, very good take. Uh, uh, on how to how to use the crisis to our advantage and how to grow through it. And I believe that the state uh, smartly applied is really has shown itself to be far more necessary than what we thought earlier in, uh, in overcoming large shocks, be it for uh, industrial companies, definitely for uh, everything connected to culture. Uh, but also definitely for everything connected to how do we quickly transform our economy to uh, to set it to grow fast. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, being a state servant is definitely good news uh, for for change. To hear that uh, state uh, is seen as necessary, maybe uh, more than uh, rather than less. But Inessa, uh, may we uh, hear your your view on the question? Well, I totally agree, and uh, the regulations that state can provide is uh, very important, and uh, which we already witnessed, and it's not only in Latvia, but the nation, national and local governments across the globe introduced like multiple measures to support uh, workers and firms in light of COVID-19, uh, but also like employments are different. Uh, companies are different. We know that there are freelance forms, hybrid forms, when there, this is like combining uh, salary part-time works and freelance work. And uh, this is very, very like actual thing in culture sector. 
and there are a lot of things that could be done better and in a bigger scale to support the this also cultural sectors and as i mentioned already before it has suffered significantly during the pandemic and 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 this is also very important because it will have this effect in not only in the upcoming months but also in upcoming years i suppose so um, what is major, what is paramount in this situation that the support that we are providing as a state, uh, that the, it reaches artists and not only artists, but also teams behind the artists and creatives, all the suppliers and other chains and, and, and the institutions itself. And so we ensure that the public support for COVID-19 uh, relief does not exclude also firms and workers uh, who support. And then uh, it's also important that parallel with the income and business support measures, uh, we invest more in cultural production because now we can see how this new cultural production is stopped worldwide. And it is very important that we invest in this already now. Uh, maybe, uh, if I may add, that uh, we should and these tax initiatives for corporate and individual donations. We had them before in Latvia. It's now cancelled already, I think, for two years or even maybe more. But it's also very important um, uh, possibility how to revoke the interest from private sector also to support specific um, sec mm -hmm. uh, cultural sector. And uh, these, all those, uh, all those steps. Uh, which I have to say, even those uh, supports that we already got, uh, they were very thoughtful and uh, implemented very fast. And we can see the result uh, of them also very, very in the short period. So any help is, is really important. And of course, everyone is uh, understanding the situation that we are in. And, and but me meanwhile, everyone is also looking the for the possibilities to think innovatively which I might um, comment a bit more on later. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, Gatti, Spirit, uh, Jakobs, uh, maybe you have something to add uh, before we uh, move to the next. Uh, Jakobs, I see you have a hand raised. Yes, uh, and I totally agree that there is a, a certain role of uh, state to play, and I totally, totally agree to Janis, which I think Janis mentioned, it's smart involvement of the state. And I think that uh, in financial instruments, and if we talk about support to, to in a financial instrument way, the role of state is actually to crowd in privates. So, and after this crisis and during this crisis, we see that this volatility is is uh, growing and this uncertainty is growing, and privates are uh, are not taking not not ready to take those risks, uh, perhaps in a way, in amounts we would like to. So. We can we can do uh, from state side. State can take some part of those risks away with small money, like like in the, like for example, we we have this uh, uh, credit holiday guarantee, so which is actually made of let's say 20% of state's funding, which we multiply in guarantees and add to that also private private uh, funding so it it multiplies to some eight eight times so and we take small part of risks away and we provide for big uh, amount this liquidity support to companies so the state has to look for ways to take some smaller part of risks away to make uh, possible private to go in with funding hmm? okay thanks um if uh, if if not for the moment, then um, I may um, I I will ah sorry got this yes yeah just a very short uh, note uh, I think that um, government institute or state institutions were able in a very short time to mobilize uh, uh, funding for short term research on uh, on how to overcome COVID nineteen crisis and and you know the, the researchers were forming groups very fast and and started to work on 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 very specific specific research topics that would would help in the short term and and we we will probably we already can see some interesting results and probably will see some more so state state played a very good role in in in, in that perspective mm -hmm. 
Um, Spirit, um, I will be uh, moving to uh, to the next question, and uh, maybe I would like uh, actually for you to uh, open our next question. And uh, I send the participants uh, questions stating out that uh, pretty much with uh, COVID-19, we have arrived at, uh, some would argue, a more agile or more dynamic uh, goal and KPI uh, setting mechanisms. And that's something that links together with uh, what Kaspar said before, that uh, we have this uh, mission-oriented approach or mission-oriented uh, innovation. So um, maybe, uh, Pirit, uh, you could uh, comment on this and uh, maybe uh, because I know uh, with your uh, professional background in uh, anticipatory innovation governance and uh, that you have probably not uh, more too much too many more phrases more interesting for you than to say that future is uncertain uh, so uh maybe you could uh, shed some light on uh, on the topic of kpis goals and being more dynamic and agile mm -hmm. thank you definitely so starting off from where the discussions left off that uh, indeed i see for the state as well but the state and also companies need to have different capabilities uh, in the crisis and beyond the crisis as well so usually in the crisis situation as well that you need agility and adaptiveness and kind of tactical capability so there are always going to be crises that you are unable to foresee uh, we are not able to see foresee every single thing that is going to happen our world is extremely complex and there are going to be crises and shocks that are going to come towards us, and especially in small states where some of these factors uh, are beyond our control as well. So you have to have this kind of slack and ability to dynamically respond tactically to start acting within a crisis situation. Uh, but the other part is as well that you have to have this kind of long term view or anticipation of different scenarios of futures or upcoming things. Uh, because just saying like let's act now or respond to things that are kind of changing on the get-go is not going to give us a huge and the only way to actually do that is to say which kind of future did you want to see so anticipate that uh, like what are the kind of the trends that are upcoming in terms of future work or where the cultural sector for example is going so and where do we actually want it to go and start acting upon it today so start innovating on it today but these are of course two very different kind of if you think about teams working as well then uh, two teams that were working one in a kind of very tactical oriented way we have a crisis we need this amount of masks mm -hmm. or this amount of vaccines to these amount of people is one way of acting versus the other saying well we have these kind of uh, long to medium term effects that may come up from the crisis or change how we do science or in our cultural sector and we need to kind of change our model of operating today towards this so these are two very different things that usually cannot be done in kind of same units or same teams. So I actually have to develop different types of cap capacities and capabilities within your organizations to to make that happen. So not only kind of having the tactical response, but also having the kind of anticipatory response. And we have seen that also happening in different countries that uh, and also in big private sector organizations and corporations uh, that have both kind of the tactical response and kind of sense making teams, uh, but also the kind of the future looking teams as well. Mm -hmm. Thanks, uh, Janis. You were just nodding, uh, nodding along uh, when 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 Pirit was talking. Uh, I was also maybe ask, willing to ask you the same question. Sorry, uh, the same question, but also maybe you could comment uh, whether you think that this uh, uh, crisis has changed the ways how you recruit people for your businesses, or maybe you have changed something that you are looking for uh, in your employees. Is that a question to me? Yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah. I, okay, so first of all, I wanted to disagree a little bit with Pirin. Ah, I think what she, uh, so some things she said right and some things I disagree. So I think what we did differently in Latvia was that we, we separated uh, the strategy in three parts, stabilize, reset, try. And uh, you have to have very tactical on the ground understanding of how you are stabilizing because it is very important to preserve the existing companies, to preserve existing structure, because without structures, you can't grow very fast. And so 
stabilize is very tactical and you should whatever you do to stabilize is tactical is purely to answer like whatever works just find out ways how to do it is purely tactical then reset is purely strategic so when when you are thinking about how the world is changing and where you want to go you want to ask the question how the world has changed and then to to develop a strategy out of it and then tribe is the third segment to it it's it's already which mechanisms kind of you put into place to grow and i feel that in latvia by separating in three distinct parts we can do everything simultaneously so we don't have to distinguish between tactical and strategic and we have to say oh tactical is like low and we have to be strategic no we have to be tactical for stabilization mm -hmm. and strategic for growing into future direction at the same time and we have a clear set of tools of how we do for thrive and I think that this is kind of the the, the crisis response that uh, yields the best uh, opportunities. Um, as uh, what concerns uh, the other question that was the uh, on uh, on the recruitment, I think nothing has changed uh, in there. So I feel that uh, recruitment is recruitment. You anyway need good people that are able to create something new, and uh, that's whom you recruit. So that's it. <laughs> Okay, uh, Pirit, I was wondering, maybe you want to uh, comment or come back with a couple of follow-ups or? No, I don't I didn't think actually that we disagree, that I think that you have to have these capabilities and capacities at the same time. And it's the difficult part that you have to actually uh, like have this longer term view or research or driving view at the same time that you're tactical as well. Uh, what right. tends to happen in organizations and also in public sector organizations that whatever is on the table at the moment always overrides a little bit uh, like this kind of um, you know long term view because it's also kind of the motivators and incentives that you have in public sector that are slightly missing uh, that are in the, in the private sector are there so you can you have a share and you have profits that you also want to uh, kind of recapitalize and uh, have there after the crisis as well. While in the public sector, you you know, the feedback system, the KPIs are more difficult to measure and the kind of the motivation system. So you actually have to kind of cognizantly and systematically invest more uh, in the public sector for those capabilities and capacities to actually emerge. Mm -hmm. Just uh, commenting on our side, uh, also within the agency, uh, we have uh, considerably uh, put in uh, resources, both time and others, uh, in order to understand how to best draw up KPIs that would be reflective of the particular niche role of the state that uh, it should play, for instance, not simply solely in, uh, say, providing financial mechanisms and uh, and, uh, and, and, and and starting credits, but, uh, but also others. Uh, Jakobs, uh, maybe uh, you want to add something on the KPIs and, uh, and 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 the nature how has it changed uh, with the current situation? Uh, to to our experience, uh, what what works uh, works actually is uh, when what what is uh, prerequisites to be able to 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 stand up to crisis or to take opportunities uh, is that uh, there has to be a paramount sense of purpose in a company. Let's say in Autumn's case, we had uh, we have a mission uh, to help the Latvia to grow. But when crisis strike, it was clearly that we have to provide fast instruments for liquidity support, and uh, that that kind of was was uh, paramountly understood and and supported in company. And there would be, we should not spend any any discussion actually on that already. And so what's and then we added actually pretty clear and and uh, and that easy to measure uh, KPIs let's say for 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 uh, working capital loans we 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 said we make decision in five days and if for for guarantee we make it in two days it's easy to measure it's really understandable for everyone and and uh, it kind of clearly says what we want to achieve and then only after of that we understand that our process is not able to do it now. We have to redesign process. Our customers are not ready to, to provide the information we need in existing process. So we we build out of that already. So I think uh, we need two things, three three main things. One is clear purpose. Second, KPI, and third is internal trust. So 
if that is in, in, in a company, then you, you can do a lot of things. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, actually, something that you said, uh, I don't know purposefully or not, but uh, feeds into the next uh, question uh, uh, that uh, forwarded our uh, distinguished panelists before uh, regarding uh, this application of uh, of technology and a massive uh, and, and and relatively fruitful, you may say, and uh, potential uh, lack of trustworthiness or or, or or credibility that comes with it. Either uh, you have it with a kind of business uh, discussions or with kind of just simply minimizing the face-to-face -face contact and uh, and 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 uh, how how does how does this has changed and whether it has changed. Uh, your daily operations, and and then Waltz, maybe uh, I could ask you to comment uh, on this as the first one. Well, yes, starting from a bigger scale, I think uh, the GATT has already mentioned that uh, new ways of interaction uh, for researchers and also for uh, for uh, congresses and conferences. So clearly, in medicine, uh, the large conferences and exhibitions was part of the part of the way we operated. So like conventions of 30,000 people, cardiologists coming into one place and uh, or, uh, or, or, or medical exhibitions. These were uh, something which were in place for years. And obviously you need to touch something uh, like a new device and to understand and have those discussions. Currently, I don't think it's it's replaced in some way. Yeah, and, and it still needs to be solved how, how, to, how, how it uh, should be addressed in the future. Although some of the congresses really have a, have a turn digital and even uh, provide more flexibility and opportunity to interact and, and to, to, to learn more and, and to read more and to listen more. But uh, that face-to-face uh, -face collaboration clearly quite often leads to, to some collaboration in research or participation in consortia projects which currently, I don't know if, if, if we are that successful. The other thing which we see at the hospital, we, we, we do have a professional links uh, uh, with uh, like for observerships or hands-on trainings for specialists, which currently are on hold as well. And finally, just very, very narrowly, uh, well, I, I did have a, like a improvement walks, if I may say so, around the hospital when you see the things and, and, and with intention really to, to improve, but also engage with the staff and to, to mm -hmm. set the right mindset. So these are these are not happening. So we can, I cannot really talk to every nurse uh, like on a Zoom, etc. So, but when you are in a in a face to face uh, that discussion, you see what things uh, need to be improved and where where potentially there's a room for innovation. And and, and finally, I, I would like to say that um, uh, well, one clearly thing which is changing is that uh, traditional, I, I don't think we, we were hierarchical, but anyway, the traditional hierarchical leadership style really doesn't work uh, in, 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 uh, in any working from distance or working from home environment. And that command and control really is not useful at all in a digital uh, space, uh, where really uh, the more distance inevitably uh, means less control. And, and that seems unavoidable. And, and better companies and leaders really recognize this and, uh, and, and should adopt to the new normal by really adopting also the leadership style, which hasn't been emphasized too much. And uh, we could call it a digital leadership, or I don't know, but uh, that's something uh, which, which uh, and also from a government perspective, I think that, 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 that also serves there and the achievement of common objectives or TPIs mm. were mentioning that kind of employs the different ways how to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, excellent. Uh, Ines, Yanis, uh, maybe you want to add something on this? Well, yes, this digital leadership um, left me thinking because uh, I can't agree that it's not uh, it's not possible to uh, control or to have this also uh, leadership in the company, but uh, I, I do understand that you relate about what about this saying about definitely and this is a huge topic and I think a lot of people would appreciate if this specific theme would, would uh, have its own uh, conference I assume but speaking about um, innovations definitely uh, innovation is essential in this state and not only in cultural sector but everywhere uh, everybody started to do this and if we speak about innovations that especially the ones that are technological uh, and uh, if we speak about culture sector, then 
that could be uh, these are the technological innovations that could be adapted to also other forms um, or formats uh, uh, such as innovations in content, including also mixed uh, use of different media, also changing of format totally, as we also did with the biennial, that we, while having the biennial, we created a feature film, uh, which is like not only documentary, but a series 90 minutes length of the, the, the movie. And why we did it, because this digital content is something where you can still reach the audience, while physical, one is forbidden um, and of course all those innovations uh, there were some and uh, I, I think that Jacobs also mentioned it that some were more ready for this crisis um, as others and I don't think that it's only because they were getting ready for it it's not only because they had some savings or better teams but also some of the companies are better fit for this specific um, situation as we see also uh, with a huge interest for example in streaming platforms Ingmar is not today here but uh, we all know i think about the success huge success of netflix for example which is also a cultural sector but uh, when we are talking about massive digitalization, uh, uh, I have uh, this question that I'm thinking a lot about. What is uh, this happily ever after? What will hap happen after? Because now we are in this state that this will end up soon. I don't know, it, at least me, I, I have this feeling that this is not forever. Uh, one year, two years, and we will be out of it and there will be a new situation. Maybe I'm wrong, hope I'm not. But uh, what is this after? Uh, what is the stage um, with what we will uh, what will be left behind? What will we use afterwards as well? Because now we are also willing to use all the digital platforms, all the possibilities to communicate, all the Zooms, Microsoft Teams, whatever. Uh, also, we are willing to work with our Teams via with Slack or any other channel where we can control them but what will happen afterwards uh, also in cultural sector we can see a lot how people are trying to find i don't know put all the content uh, on the digital platforms create uh, the galleries digital the galleries also collectors are trying to respond to it but honestly i have a feeling as soon as we will be able to meet and hug again uh, we will switch to this physical experience uh, very fastly. And I would also suggest that uh, already now we should think more in what actually we are investing in, because maybe there is something that won't be so necessary anymore, hopefully, in a few years ahead. So uh, definitely this is a time to invest in digital infrastructure and also the one that can can apply amplify in uh, advances in culture culture and, and creative sectors this is definitely a time to support artists their teams uh, suppliers and uh, not only because this is a nice sector that, that suffered significantly but because, but also because this pandemic shows that actually culture has a huge role we we need the culture significantly and not only because of our interest but also of our well-being and i'm not afraid to say and also our health mm -hmm. and and this is also a time actually when uh, when we invest in digital uh, things or any other initiatives that we invest also very much in the local initiatives because this is a time when we can speak more with the local audiences mm -hmm. and what else I wanted to say is that uh, this is also a time when we can find another ways how to reach completely another audiences, as I was mentioning already, as we, we did with the biennial. So usually biennials are attended by someone who like or are interested in contemporary art. But while we created the movie, we are now looking also to the audiences, which is are uh, the ones uh, who actually used to the films, screenings, uh, cinemas, and this is kind of another audience. And all you could just did, you switch the format. So yes, um, I think that innovations is very important. and. Okay. Good luck.
So, <laughs> uh, Janis, maybe uh, you could uh, comment uh, shortly as well the technological shift and, and, and pros and cons. Yes, I feel that the <clears throat> uh, culture. Of course, we can live without culture, and uh, this this pandemic has clearly shown that. But the life is soulless and miserable, and uh, and uh, in that sense, I think clearly uh, I would agree also with Ina said that uh, we will go back. Uh, we will go back to to normal in more ways than uh, what we think. Uh, my personal experience uh, regarding tele uh, management is uh, I'm 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 running a, a company that operates worldwide. So uh, we for years have had uh, tele meetings like uh, set scheduled tele meetings. We've been using Zoom and, and other platforms uh, for a very long time already before COVID. And uh, clearly you can manage uh, using that. So as in coordinate uh, known uh, routine tasks is totally possible. Uh, what I find impossible uh, using uh, teleconferencing and Zoom is really deep innovation. So uh, a colleague from uh, the uh, Children's Hospital, Mr. Abels, uh, mentioned like the, I don't know, Gemba walks walking around and getting rich management information is impossible. You, you can't get rich management information uh, uh, not observing it uh, on the spot. You can't have rich cultural experience. You can't have rich, uh, uh, rich uh, transformative in, in experiences. And I feel that this kind of a serendipity that is necessary uh, for a deeper understanding and also for creating new ideas, which is a big reason why we actually do culture, because they kind of throw in our place suddenly an idea and, and when we start to think differently, or why we travel is, is I think, the same, mm -hmm. uh, or why we visit, go benchmark other companies is the same. So you have serendipity and you have different ideas. Those are impossible to do via Zoom, come on. And so uh, uh, for me, maybe the takeaway uh, from this is that uh, I can see how I can manage even more and clearly like manage certain known things uh, using Zoom. And then maybe don't use travel so much anymore in the future just for management, because now it's more clear how to manage, you know, using mm -hmm. remotely even than before it was, but even more clear that we have to uh, have to invent ways how, how we can get the innovative part of the management, innovative part of the meetings. And then I'm structuring management versus innov innovation in how I, how I see and structure meetings going forward. And definitely, I think that a typical human kind of mistake in thinking is to think that the current state is going to be like forever. So if we are pre-pandemic, we think, oh, pandemics never come. And then when we are in pandemic, we think, oh, we'll be forever in pandemic. Neither is true. So clearly we'll be out of pandemic. The question is, how do we prepare for that? And I think many people worldwide are making the mistake of thinking that this is going to be like that forever. I think this is a mistake. And I think this is a great opportunity for us in Latvia to think, so how the world is going to be after pandemic? It's not going to be a Zoom world. It's going to be something different. So what is going to be? And what are we doing to prepare for it? And how do we prepare for it first? So that we gain competitive advantage and uh, we move faster than the others that are kind of uh, still uh, thinking that this is going to continue forever. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Janis. And uh, we just received that uh, actually uh, Waltz and Piret, uh, as we started late, uh, later, uh, must, uh, must, must move on to next telecom. Uh, I mean, thanks, guys, for, uh, for joining us and your inputs were, uh, were truly uh, valuable. And uh, you will hear what uh, we will discuss because this is going to be a recording. So uh, let's stay in touch. But uh, we will then uh, wrap up the discussion and forward you the forward you the video recap later on. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. And uh, maybe just uh, before we go to the to the final uh, section uh, of the discussion, uh, we touched upon uh, and we're continuing in English as we have so many international. Uh, we'll uh, have so many international viewers. Then uh, regarding this technolo technological shift and that was touched upon also. Uh, uh, basically, the inability maybe to uh, have a proper exchange of ideas and culture and, and, and how we discussed in the uh, workshop uh, on design thinking that uh, it uh, does uh, make an impact on the decreasing speed of uh, innovation. And uh, maybe got this coming from, uh, from a university uh, and, and, and research uh, realm uh, 
maybe you could shed some view on uh, your take uh, about uh, the fact that uh, this uh, time and these changes that we are experiencing are actually, uh, some would say, uh, decreasing the speed of innovation. Well, uh, as you probably know, the, the, the re research area and innovation area is, uh, well, is, is kind of slow. It's, it, it, the system has large inertia. Uh, I, I, well, it's too early to observe, actually, any effect, I would say. Uh, on one hand, we can say that uh, we were able to mobilize uh, small research teams and, and funding for for our coming uh, COVID crisis, and that that kind of promoted innovation uh, because new new interesting ideas came out and uh, are coming out. Uh, but so the long term consequences, it's hard to observe. Uh, I I think that 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 digitalization that we experience currently is rather small part of what we are actually will have and what we are already having i'm speaking about um, use of artificial intelligence and robotics and uh, what is interesting discussion is um, uh, who will actually will be employed in a new economy when artificial intelligence will will be very widely used, who will be out of job, how inclusive will be society, because, because it already now actually I would, I would say that quite large part of our society cannot manage all the digital, digital tools that, that are required, like internet banking and things like that. So already some part of society is out actually. Uh, uh, left out, not, inclus not included in economy in full scale because they don't have sufficient digital skills. And, and what is, I think, what we should think maybe is that how that massive uh, digital transformation will actually change, change society, how inclusive it will be, uh, what kind of skills uh, we will actually need now, but thinking about uh, innovation uh, processes such, I would say that I would agree with Zines and, and Yanis will be probably back to, 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 to normal quite soon. Uh, and uh, but what is more interesting is really that that the other processes of digitalization that we are now experiencing. OK, uh, thanks. Uh, thanks for that. And um, um, I mean, I must say um, I am. Um, there, there are a couple of takeaways, but uh, we're um, that I was uh, willing to maybe expand the discussion even more. But we're uh, running out of time, so moving to the last uh, section, and uh, obviously our agency is uh, hosting the event, so we want to be uh, a bit egoistic and uh, pragmatic, and uh, and ask you a question and hear your views on some takeaways that uh, we decided uh, maybe to play with um, after the design thinking. Uh, workshop and also actually after uh, today's discussion because as uh, Walt said a uh, uh, very cool thing that uh, uh, we I, I have also personally uh, considered that, that the change of command and control mechanisms also are required uh, throughout these times uh, uh, either it is uh, technological solutions or say or say that uh, uh, employees characters are changing and also what was said by, by Jacobs that uh, uh, Jakobs listed uh, that you have to have uh, the sense of purpose, uh, measurable KPIs, and uh, then you can uh, drive forward. And so taking this into account and uh, taking into account uh, our agency's, uh, say, treacherous but uh, daring uh, proposition that uh, one change uh, that could be, for instance, uh, deriving after this pandemic, is that maybe, say, uh, governments or agencies or, or the state uh, should not uh, be imposed like top-down uh, kind of goals or measurable KPIs that uh, these particular institutions are not always solely in charge of, but that uh, this should be the change that comes from the pandemic that actually maybe state at some moment should rather uh, operate as the accumulator of the KPIs and kind of change its uh, function to more 
horizontal, more uh, communication and kind of building the strategy together by communication and understanding the various of um, of the economy and society. So my question, uh, and then and, and, and as we're running out of time, maybe try to keep it uh, short if possible. Then uh, first, uh, so uh, what do you think about the uh, state uh, being a coordinator of uh, pan say country KPIs? Um, yes, no, maybe a short comment. And uh, second question or second part, uh, if not or if yes. Uh, maybe you could elaborate on what do you personally believe uh, how the state role has changed? Because uh, I heard a lot that uh, you all pretty much said that uh, the state role has changed. But maybe if you can try to um, build a particular case when, for instance, before it, state was seen more as financing body for this, this and this, then now state should be serve as more of a... Um, um, artist of connection or, or or whatever. So I know it's quite a challenging question, but uh, but uh, uh, just uh, just uh, any views on that uh, would be uh, greatly appreciated. And uh, Jakobs, uh, I haven't heard uh, from you in a while, so maybe you could uh, you could kick this. Off. This is uh, actually this is kind of uh, tricky and um, pretty complex question. I would say on one hand. Uh, some of us have seen what it means if state is trying to plan everything, so it, it ends up badly usually. And that kind of frightens me if state is setting out KPIs for everyone, it cannot be a good idea. I think that uh, the role of state is yes, to provide strategies to explain uh, goals, explain why and how we can succeed. And provide necessary, perhaps take some risks away, but then don't mess with this state step away and, and let uh, companies, private companies and state companies and state agencies to do their work. And see, I think, yes, the state's role is mainly to, to, to coordinate, to set a target, but to, to do it in a way that it lets companies to be creative and to adapt and also to agencies to be creative and to adapt. And uh, I think what our government has, has demonstrated in a spring was unusually and very, very successful decisiveness to make decisions, to, to, uh, to provide resources and uh, to take some barriers off. That, uh, that was really good. But I don't think that with such same decisiveness they should set KPA for everyone. I'm um, perhaps I'm not, uh, not not correct, but that's my thoughts for, for that question now. Uh, thanks for that. I was just uh, willing to double confirm that uh, I didn't imply setting KPIs in uh, instead of businesses or in uh, for businesses. I was rather thinking of accumulating and coordinating and uh, putting it into a same uh, similar strategy or, um, or or whatever i don't know ines uh, got this janis who wants to uh who wants to go next i think you choose yeah, okay ines uh, go okay well, what can i say in a state of crisis big or small one always we need someone to look up to and of course this uh, role of state is uh, is the one that defi def defines the situation and helps to, to to navigate through this situation but uh, it's also very important that this is not one way uh, way because it's important that uh, all everyone is involved and with a lot of discussions and communications because yes we don't have a lot of time for discussions but sometimes by uh, hearing out other opinions, we can make better decisions. Um, so role of state is definitely really uh, big now. And this is also a huge opportunity because because of that, we can also change a lot of things. Because previously, and Latvia is a unique country, we, uh, people here, more unlike in other European countries, we are like, uh, let us do our business, let us do our projects, and please state, don't interfere, just leave us alone, figure it out. In this crisis situation, it's a kind of a little, a little bit another way around. We are 
trying to find to hear any good possible news to 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 figure out how to survive and how to proceed and if we could uh, if if state takes uh, this chance to to gain a better trust and better uh, coordinating between different sectors as well it's uh, it's a very good thing that could come out of this situation okay thanks uh, gatis uh, your 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 take on the topic uh, yeah well um, it, our world becomes uh, more and more fragile as we know for different reasons for because we now very have very fast uh, uh, flow of money we can have very fast flow of people if they can move around of course and then we have also challenges associated with, with the global warming etc etc so, uh, feeling is that we will go through the quite turbulent times also in future and and state role is very important as we see just to to have this coordinating role to have that uh, to to preserve that resilience or increase that resilience in the system uh, on the other hand um, we should be aware that there should be a very well balanced uh, intervention of of state uh, preservance of of privacy of people uh, let's say preservance of 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 uh, liber liberal let's say liberal mechanisms of the market economy so we, we will have to find a very f fine balance between strong state as a coordinator and 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 uh, still the freedom of businesses and private private people so that will be quite challenging but the role of of state uh, will increase i guess due to these uh, let's say um crisis situations or turbulent times okay. thanks alice i i feel that there is a uh, that we have to take between efficiency and robustness whenever we are designing something and uh, i feel that uh, we we used to have a, a system where we were emphasizing efficiency and for efficiency, you need the minimum state and the maximum allocation of resources uh, for the private sector because they can they can use these resources more efficiently. And uh, the problem is, uh, what do you do in a case of big crisis? So uh, where do you find robustness uh, to, to for for bounce back? Where do you find the slack that is necessary? And uh, the, the easiest way how to organize that is via state because uh, there you can can accumulate slack resources with which you can then uh, uh, kind of overcome uh, the crisis. So I feel that in that sense, uh, the state's role has grown larger and, and we understand the state's role more. It is to provide that uh, robustness that gives us that anti-fragility, the, the ability to thrive in a, in a case of crisis. And if we have uh, that additional resource, then we can really apply it and then we can find ways and grow out of the crisis in a, in a good way before the others uh, are doing that. And then uh, kind of gain in, in the relative prosperity towards others uh, more, which is, I think, good. And then, uh, but uh, what regards to KPIs, I think that nobody knows the future and nobody knows what the future is going to be. And I think if somebody thinks that he knows the future, he should go and play in the markets uh, and not participate in any other, anything else uh, for the other. But I don't believe that there are such people. Anyway, uh, I think that uh, nobody knows the future. And I think that uh, this means that we can't have KPIs anymore, especially during the crisis. It's impossible to have KPIs. Uh, I think that what we can have is an answer to the question how the world has changed. And what we can have is we can ask these questions once per quarter and see if our answers are different now than they used to be. And then we can have a kind of a compass heading, depending on you know where do we feel these answers are. These are the questions, answers that the state uh, should be involved, in my opinion, in in, in answering. I important is not only to to have them, also to to have it kind of more widely. Uh, I, I wish the Latvian strategy was popularized more widely by the government and Leah. I felt that it's uh, really necessary, and that would have contributed. Uh, much to the kind of common understanding of where we are heading and what are the ways how we go. And I feel that, um, I feel, you know, setting this compass heading and re-asking, where do we stand right now? What has changed? How the world has changed? How, 
how can we win out of it is the way how we can proceed further okay excellent um i mean uh, i definitely agree and uh, i think that uh, this actually exercise together with the workshop and discussion today is just uh, as we already discussed uh, one step of kind of making this uh, kind of directions for the compass uh, uh, I wouldn't say clear, but uh, maybe less vague and uh, more more indicating the right direction. So uh, uh, on this note, uh, as as Yanis said, uh, I would uh, like to uh, I would like to uh, say and and I hope that there is going to be enough of efficiency and robustness uh, for each of us uh, in the future and uh, for us to try to. Uh, stay and keep this in balance. So uh, with this, um, I mean, it has been a very uh, joyful discussion. So very insightful. So again, thank you uh, for, 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 for participation. And uh, in Latvia, we're having our uh, National Day celebrations tomorrow. So actually, I also wish you uh, to have a calm and bright, uh, bright celebration tomorrow. And, uh, and, and then stay safe. So thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you for great moderation. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.